Welcome to Bluegrass. We are so glad that you joined us today. We hope you find this time together to be uplifting and inspirational. Above all, we want you to feel welcome. So if you have any questions, prayer requests, or just want to know more about how to get connected to Bluegrass, visit bluegrassumc.org slash connect. This week, Doug continues the mission. Despite the changes that have taken place in our world, the mission remains the same. The world needs Jesus, and it's up to us to offer Jesus to the world. Again, thanks for being with us today. Let's begin. Let's sing together. On a hill far away stood an old rugged cross the emblem of suffering and shame and i love that old cross where the dearest and best for a world of lost sinners was slain so I'll cherish the old rugged cross Till my trophies at last I lay down I will cling to the old rugged cross And exchange it someday for cross I will ever be true it's shame and reproach gladly bear and then you'll call me someday to my home far away where is glory forever cherish the old rugged cross till my trophies at last I lay down I will cling to the old rugged cross and exchange it someday for a The splendor of the King, clothed in majesty, let all the earth rejoice, all the earth rejoice. He wraps himself in light, and darkness drives. And his voice and trembles at his voice. How great is our God? Sing with me, how great is our God, and all will see how great, how great. Oh, 
above all names. You're the name above all names. Oh, so worthy of all praise. My heart will sing how great is our God. Name above all names. Would you pray with me? Father in heaven, we love you and we praise you. We honor and adore you. What a privilege it is to worship you, to gather as the body of Christ, to come together in your name and to elevate your name above every other name. And that's why we have gathered to worship you, to bring you praise, honor, and glory. As we look to your glory and, and to your holiness, we are reminded of our sin, our sinfulness. We're reminded where we fall short, and we would confess that to you. We ask that you would forgive us, that you would cleanse and purify us, that you would make us as holy as you are holy. Lord, we lift up our congregation to you. We know that there is much hurt and much pain. We know of several in our congregation who have lost loved ones. We have lost family from our church this week, and we lift up each of those families. We thank you for each of these dear church members who have meant so much to us and to our church. We lift up each person that is struggling, whether in the loss of a loved one, whether it's in sickness, whether it's struggling with a job, struggling at school, struggling personally or relationally or in, in any way, Lord, we come together as the body and we pray for one another. We ask, O oh God, that you would make yourself uh, wonderfully known to each person in their situation so that they can be strengthened and empowered and be given your peace. So come Holy Spirit, come and do your work in us and among us in this time of worship. Help us now as we pray that prayer that Jesus taught his disciples. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. So back in March and April of this year, as it was becoming clear that the pandemic was ramping up and, and would require the closing of schools and businesses, I, along with countless others, parents and caregivers, suddenly developed a far deeper appreciation for educators. For those who in so many ways help us raise our kids as part of a community of support and care, pouring into their lives, inspiring them, teaching them, and helping them become the best versions of themselves. Their professionalism and passion, their love for their students, and their sense of calling were put on full display, as in a matter of days they didn't just rewrite, but reimagined a semester's worth of curriculum for their students. Virtually overnight, they worked out how they would equip and empower parents to be part of the education of their kids in ways many of us have never had to before. On video chats and phone calls, through email and snail mail, they reached out in every way they could at all times of the day to let our kids know that they weren't alone, they, they weren't forgotten. 
that wherever they were, they were still their students and that their teachers were with them in the season of upheaval and uncertainty. And as a parent, I've always known that my kids' teachers cared for them and, and would go to great lengths to help them succeed, but, but this was some next level stuff. And I continue to be amazed as this drive and determination, this commitment to our kids shines through in the shifting landscape that is our world today. So for that and so much more, even as you continue to adapt and adjust to the circumstances in which we find ourselves in an effort to reach and teach our kids in a safe and welcoming space to our teachers, our school administrators, faculty and staff, I wanna start off today by saying thank you. We see you, we appreciate you and all that you're doing. Each day I'm reminded of the passion and vision that's driving those working in education right now. And one of the ways I see that personally is in a longtime friend of mine, Ryan. He's currently serving as the assistant principal at a high school in Kentucky. Throughout his tenure in education, as a teacher and as an administrator, Ryan has made no secret that his passion, the thing that gets him out of bed every morning, is the call on his life to invest in the lives of kids. In particular, Ryan has a heart for those kids on the margins, the kids that others might be tempted to write off because of the difficulties they face or behaviors they have that create barriers those kids for whom it could be so easy to simply slip through the cracks. Ryan seeks those kids out with the intentionality and intensity of someone on a rescue mission. And what's more, he invites everyone else to come alongside him. Because for him, reaching out to these kids isn't just some theory of pedagogy, some educational ideal. This is to be the lived mission of educators, to fight for the best of every child in their care and to model that in the way they live. And so Ryan's Facebook feed is filled with things like this. This is what he said a couple weeks ago. I have a challenge for you. Find one tough kid today. Use every moment you can this week to shower him or her with positivity, to build connection, and to make sure he or she is valued, seen, and heard. I promise, come Friday, you'll have a brand new kid. Three exclamation points, hashtag connections before content. And there are more posts than I can count on his page that, that carry a similar message one of investing in relationships with kids for whom such connections might make all the difference. But the post on his page that caught my eye as I was thinking about today's message was, was one he made just a little over a week ago. I, it was a picture of his fitness watch with his step count in focus. Now, now, pictures like this, they aren't all that unusual from Ryan. If there's one thing he's nearly as passionate about as he is about reaching and teaching kids, it's physical fitness. But it was the text of the post that caught my eye. It said this, this little piece right here, it looks like a watch, but it's actually a measuring stick. By tracking my steps, it tells me if I've met my visibility factor for the day. 10,000 steps equals in the halls more than in my office. When kids see you more, they know you see them too. Hashtag valued, seen, heard. You see, Ryan's love for his students isn't just some abstraction but something that quite literally moves him as he gets up, goes out, and, and meets his kids where they are. And I love this post because it connects so well with what we're talking about today as we continue our sermon series discussing the mission of the church in the world. Much like Ryan's post, this week we're talking about where the mission of the church meets movement, where words meet action as we proclaim the gospel with all that we are, that the world may know and the lost may be saved in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And we'll start today by looking at this passage from Matthew 5, verses 13 through 16. It's an excerpt from Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, and it goes like this. You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden, neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. In his message last week, Doug reminded us of the mission we were given by Christ in Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 through 20. It's a timeless mission for the whole church and everyone who would call themselves Christian to go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything he's commanded. And this week in this passage, we start to see what that looks like, how we live that out. Here, Jesus is saying to all who would hear that the call on the church 
as we join in the mission of God, is to go into the world and be who we are in him, who we were created to be. And so you may ask, well, well, what does that mean exactly? Who does he say we are? Well, Jesus tells us, he says, you want to know who you are? You are the salt of the earth. You're the light of the world, and you need to behave as such. One commentator says that we might more readily understand the imagery Jesus is using here if if we replace salt with red hot peppers or, or something else with a really strong flavor, something that's impossible to miss when it's there. In short, Jesus is saying here that we are in the world to be noticed. What good is salt, he says, if it doesn't taste salty anymore? What's the point? Or what good's a lamp if you light it and then hide it under a bowl? You are the salt and the light and the red hot peppers of the world, Jesus tells the church. And in your fulfillment of the mission of the kingdom of God to make disciples, you are meant to be seen. You are meant to be noticed. So get out there and start showing off who you are. Now, admittedly, this kind of message from scripture, it can feel a little bit counterintuitive, can it? After all, the Bible has a lot to say about the dangers of things like pride and and selfishness. Jesus wants us to go out of the world and show off? I mean, are are we supposed to act like overexcited little kids shouting, look at me, look what I can do, and seeking attention everywhere we go? That doesn't quite sound right, does it? After all, it's just a few verses later in the same sermon that that Jesus goes on to say in Matthew 6.1, be careful not to practice your righteousness in front of others to be seen by them. If you do, you'll have no reward from your Father in heaven. So which is it? Are we supposed to go out and get noticed or not? Is getting attention for who we are and the stuff we're doing right or wrong? And that's a fair question. After all, we we don't really want to get this wrong, do we? But what's what's important to note here is that while both of these passages speak of the nature of good works and the value of being seen doing them, they differ in one very important way, and that's motivation. Throughout scripture in the Psalms and the prophets, we read time and again that doing the right thing for the wrong reasons is very often the wrong thing. God's all about the heart, all about what motivates our actions. And so in Matthew 5, 13 through 16, when Jesus tells us to let our light shine before others, to go out and get noticed, it's for the purpose of others seeing our good deeds, seeing a changed people doing the work of the kingdom of God, and then giving glory to God as a result of the change he has brought about and the work he is doing through his church. On the other hand, in Matthew 6, 1, what Jesus speaks against is this idea of doing good things in front of others with the end goal of being seen, not in service to a larger mission, but in service to our own agendas and egos. Though it may be the right thing, it's robbed of its righteousness and that it's done for the wrong reasons. So Jesus here is calling us to live out our faith, to put action to our beliefs, and to do good works in the world, not that we might get attention, but then doing the work of the church, empowered by the Holy Spirit, inspired by our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the eyes of the world would look through us to see the God whose mission drives us and in whose name we serve, that they might be saved and join in the work as well. In short, the call on the life of the church and the life of every Christian is to a practical theology, a belief in God and his work in the world that's held so deeply and experienced so fully that it changes the very way we live and sets us to the work of the kingdom at every opportunity, shining the light of the glory of God into the world through the lives of the redeemed. This is what a living, powerful, and effective faith looks like and and who we're meant to be as we pursue the mission to which we've been called. James challenges us to this kind of faith in James chapter 2, verses 14 through 17, saying this, What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such faith save them? Suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food. If, if one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about their physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, if it's not accompanied by action, is dead. Paul says something similar, though perhaps less aggressively, in Ephesians 2, 6 through 10, where we read this. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus, in order that in the coming ages we might show the incomparable riches of his grace, expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it's by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves, it's the gift of God, not by works so that no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork, 
created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. So though we aren't saved through our good works, as Paul tells us, we are salt and light and hot peppers, every one of us, saved to the good work of the Lord in the world, to the humbling task of bearing the name of Christ and living as ambassadors for his glory. Because this mission to which we're called to go and make disciples of all nations is is by its very nature an incarnational mission, one that challenges us to follow in the footsteps of Christ. Remember, when when God saw the world lost, dying, and in need, he didn't stand far off, removed from his creation, and then called us to make our own way back to him. No, out of his overwhelming love for his lost and wayward children, his bruised and broken creation, God sent his only son to walk and talk and teach and serve and live among the people such that whoever believed in him would be redeemed to life and life eternal. So too, we who would bear the name of Christ into the world are charged to go into the world and bear that name well. Loving those whom Christ loves, serving those whom Christ would serve, giving to those to whom Christ would give. To love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and to live out that love in the way we love our neighbor, whether they live across the street, across the border, or on the other side of the world. Being the church Pursuing the mission of the kingdom of God is about more than showing up to worship and waiting for the people to come to us. It's about going out, following after Christ, and getting our hands dirty in the service of salvation. As the prophet Micah told the people of Judah in Micah 6, 8, when they wondered if their worship would be enough to merit the favor of God, he's shown you, O mortal, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? To act justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. And this is the mission to which God has called and empowered us as he tells us through the prophet Isaiah when he says this in Isaiah 42, 6 and 7. I, the Lord, have called you in righteousness. I will take hold of your hand. I will keep you and will make you to be a covenant for the people and a light for the Gentiles. To open eyes that are blind, to free captives from prison, and to release from the dungeon those who sit in darkness. Friends, the mission of the church, if we are to pursue it and pursue it well, doesn't allow us the luxury of sitting in comfort, waiting for things to be made right on some glad morning in the sweet by and by. It doesn't allow us to lean into the temptation to try to protect and preserve our own light by hiding it under a bushel. Instead, it leads us in the inspiration and empowering of the Holy Spirit, following the example of Jesus into the messiness of the work of God in the world serving, living, and giving of ourselves in such a way as to point towards something more, toward the kingdom of God that broke into the world in the person of Jesus Christ, dwells in the hearts of all believers, and will one day come in full when our King returns in victory. And to shine the light of Christ that others might make their way down the path toward redemption as well. We as the church, as citizens of the kingdom of God, are to be about the work in the world that gives honor and glory to our King, that fulfills His mission as it continues in us, and allows the world to see His heart for the least and the last and the lost lived out through His people. As John Wesley put it, the call in the life of every believer is to do all the good we can, by all the means we can in all the ways we can, in all the places we can, at all the times we can, to all the people we can, as long as ever we can. Let us be a people who declare the glory of God in prayer, in praise, in worship and song, and display that very same glorious God for the world to see in acts of love, justice, compassion, and mercy. Church, let us show the world how loved they are by God and the way they're loved by His people. To paraphrase my friend Ryan, may we let the world know those who are sick, those who are bound by the chains of sin and the shackles of injustice, those overwhelmed by the weight of the world, those facing poverty and hunger, those in seasons of grief and loss, everyone in need of a Savior to make them whole, that they are valued, seen, and heard by the God of all creation and by the church that bears His name. This is what it is to live the mission, to love the lost and the lonely and to seek and reach our world for Christ. This is what it is, not merely to to say to those in need, God be with you, but to declare God is with you, and I am with you in his name, and we are going to walk through this together. So what does that look like for us practically, right here and now? We've heard the message, 
We've heard the call. We've taken up the mission and we want to respond. So what's our next step? Well, the first step is often the most difficult. It's learning to see the need. Inviting the Holy Spirit to open our eyes to the world around us, which in itself isn't all that challenging. You can probably think of a few things you've seen in our community and the world right now that need to change. But it's the second part of this step where things get hard. We have to see the need and then not try to hide from it. Our natural tendency is to avoid things that make us uncomfortable. And seeing hurt, seeing a need and injustice often makes us uncomfortable. So it's easier to change the channel or to look away or or to listen to something else. But if we're to fulfill our mission, we have to get comfortable with discomfort. We have to be able to see the need and move toward it so, so we can do something about it. It's messy. It's difficult, but it's absolutely necessary. The purpose of light, after all, is to go into the dark places. The next step, once we've identified the need, is to pray, discern, and discover how the resources we have, our time, our talents, our abilities, can be used to meet that need in part or in full. You don't have to do it all. Start small. But take some time to figure out what what can you do with what you have and who you are. And finally, do it. In the confidence of one who goes in the power of the Holy Spirit under the banner of the Almighty God, go and do all the good you can. And so shine the light of God in the world. And to help you get started, we've actually got some opportunities ready for you. You can get connected to them right now. I'll mention them briefly here, but but if you'd like more information, you can find all of them and find out how to get involved at bluegrassumc.org slash shine. First, we've got this month's mission focus. Our next Feed My Starving Children mobile pack event we're scheduling for December of 2021. To date, as a church, we have packed over 1.3 million meals with this organization that have been sent around the world to save the lives of kids. And we want to keep doing what we can. So starting this month, we're beginning to raise the $66,000 to help us pack enough meals to feed 745 kids for a year to help save 745 lives. And you can sponsor one of those kids, change one of those lives with just $88. You can give online or leave it in the plates at the entrance to the worship center, whichever is more convenient, and then plan to invite your friends, your families, coworkers, classmates, and show up and help pack the meals at the event when it happens next December. If you're looking for ways to feed people in our own community, we've got those too. You can go online and sponsor a few of the 1,000 cans of yams we'll be delivering to the Evansville Rescue Mission this month as part of their gobbler gathering that provides Thanksgiving food baskets to families in Vandenberg County. We can put you in touch with the Tri-State Food Bank. They're looking for volunteers to staff food collection locations at Schnucks Grocery Stores in the community on Saturday, November 14th. The Salvation Army, they're looking for volunteers to help with their off-site after-school and virtual learning programs for Cedar Hall students and schools whose programs are needing extra support as a result of COVID restrictions. They're looking for cooks to help with their feeding programs for the kids and tutors who would be available to help students with virtual learning. And next month, you'll be given the opportunity to sponsor a Christmas gift for a student at Cedar Hall. They'll provide necessities and some fun items for them just to let them know they're loved. And then when the time comes, you can help deliver those gifts to the school as well. And there are other organizations we partner with who are always looking for volunteers to join them in their mission of meeting needs in the community and around the world. We can help put you in touch with any of them you'd like. Just go to bluegrassumc.org slash shine. There are no shortage of opportunities to serve, opportunities to shine, of ways you can take up your place in pursuing the mission of the kingdom of God and sharing the love of Christ. So where will you take your light? Where is God calling you to be the salt and the light and the red hot pepper that gets, that gets the world's attention, meets them in their need, and points them to God? Our mission, should we choose to accept it, is to shine forth the glory of God in service to those he loves. So let's get to work. Please join me in prayer. Father God, we thank you so much that you have invited us to your mission in the world. We thank you so much that you call us and inspire us and empower us. And we ask, Lord, that you would give us your vision, that we would be able to see the need, that we'd be able to see those who are hurting, those who are longing for more, in need of healing, in need of restoration, in need of redemption, in need of you. And Lord, that you would help us to do what we can, where we can. 
that you would move us by your power and your might and your glory to join in your work. That the world would see you in your people. That our worship would be a worship of action as we take up your mission and give glory and honor to your name. And it is in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Let's praise Jesus. My Jesus, my Savior, Lord, there is none like you. All of my days, I want to praise the wonders of you. Shelter, tower of refuge and strength. Let every breath, all that I am, never cease to worship you. Shout to the Lord. My Jesus, my Jesus, my Savior, Lord, there is none like you. All of my days, I want to praise the wonders of your might. My comfort. Shelter tower of refuge and strength. Let every breath, all that I am, never cease to worship you. Oh, shout to the Lord, all the earth, let us see power. As always, we want to thank you so much for joining us for worship this week. Thank you for joining us from wherever you are. Thank you for your continued participation in the mission in the church, of the church in the world. We know many of you are finding support and encouragement in small groups. Many of you are serving in small groups, and we thank you. We also want to thank you for those who are continuing to participate in the worship of giving as a way of supporting the ministry and the mission of the church as it happens through Bluegrass. We can't thank you enough. It is a pleasure and an honor to be in service with you. If you'd like to find out how you can give, you can go to bluegrassumc.org slash give and do so right now. Again, thank you for being here. Thank you for worshiping with us. Thank you for being the people of God. We will see you next week.